Good evening, everyone. Today we have a session of the Expert Analytical Club. We're discussing the topic of the war in Ukraine. Today's session will have two hours. And in the first hour, we'll talk with uh, Gennady Maksak, head of the Council of Foreign Policy, Ukrainian Prism. Uh, and Evgeny Magda from Kiev, director of the Ukrainian Institute of World Politics. Hello. Arseniy Sivitsky, co-founder and director of the Center for Strategic and F Studies. I would like to remind you that we are recording this discussion and uh, we are applying the Chatham House rules, which means that uh, if you want to say something that you don't want to be quoted upon. Please let us know in advance. And in this case, we'll know that we'll not be including this quote into the recording and everybody else will know that you should not be quoted on this. I would like to remind you that we have a, a translation interpretation in, in to English available. You are free to raise your hand in case you want to ask a question or write your questions in the chat. Now I would like to give floor to Vadim Majeka, my co-moderator. Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Vadim Majeka. I'm an analyst of the Belarusian club. Two of the four working languages, Russian, English, Ukrainian, and Belarusian. Any speaker can use any language to speak and to ask questions. Also, we have uh, Marina Avdeeva joining us later from Kharkov. She is the research director of the European Expert Association. We'll definitely give her floor. It's the third session of the Experts Club this year. Before we discussed uh, Kazakhstan changes in the execution in Belarus in March for Belarus and for majority of the countries in the region. The only topic we discuss is the war in Ukraine. And uh, I hope uh, uh, well, actually we were asked not to mention too much of Russia today, but uh, it will be here with us. We have a lot of emotions War is a very personal thing for many people in the region, particularly in Ukraine. That's why we decided to hold this session not in the first days of the war, but now, a year, a month later, because we want not only to express our emotions, but also to somehow analyze what is happening and to analyze not only what has happened and uh, also to look into the future somehow to understand what the future will bring us, our situation will affect Ukraine, Belarus and system of international security as a whole. These are the things we'll be discussing today. And uh, we'll start with question number one. What will future, what will the next few months bring Ukraine? What should Ukraine expect in the next couple of months? Some of you will talk about the internal policies, information, security, military, and so on and so forth. We'll be following the order already mentioned today, since Maria Avdeva will join us a little later. We'll start with Gennady Maksak. He's from Chernigov. This is the case when the location matters. There's a hot 
beds of resistance in Ukraine. Gennady, what do you think will happen in Ukraine in the next couple of months? Uh, hello, uh, dear friends. Uh, I am. Uh, I come from uh, Chernihiv, but uh, uh, actually, uh, if uh, I was uh, on air uh, from Chernihiv, uh, you wouldn't uh, have uh, you wouldn't have uh, heard me because uh, we do not have uh, any contact uh, even uh, on the phone. So, uh, anyone who would like to uh, get involved uh, uh, to uh, this. Uh, uh, we, we can do uh, all, not only from Chernihiv, but uh, in the western uh, part of uh, uh, Ukraine as well. So uh, to answer the question, uh, on 23rd of uh, February, we had uh, a meeting with uh, uh, diplomats, with journalists, and uh, they asked, uh, will there be war or not? And uh, at that very moment, uh, we were uh, kind of uh, in anticipation, we uh, just uh, said, it's not rational, uh, there would be sanctions. Uh, who would, uh, in their sound mind, uh, start uh, the war? Uh, maybe they will provoke us uh, in uh, Donetsk uh, region, maybe uh, extend this uh, zone, and that's it. Uh, the interpreter cannot hear uh, the speaker. We cannot hear uh, Gennady. Uh, I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you uh, every other um, uh, word, um, but maybe you can uh, switch off and switch on again. We really cannot hear the speaker. Uh, maybe uh, we can uh, give floor to Evgen Magda, and uh, at that uh, very mo moment, Gennady will be able to uh, reconnect. Uh, speaking uh, about these uh, problems with uh, connections uh, with Ukraine. So, Yevhen, uh, you have the same question. Uh, what uh, uh, should you expect the in the upcoming months? Uh, hello, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank for the interest uh, what is happening here. I understand that this interest uh, is not just a neighboring interest. It's not just about uh, looking over the fence, what's happening uh, there. I would say that at the expert level, the feeling of interest uh, from the Belarus side is much higher than on the average level. We will speak about what it means uh, for Belarus later. I think that Ukraine will uh, continue to uh, surprise everyone because uh, actually Ukrainian military uh, already surprised Europe and the world because uh, the Western experts uh, in general uh, majority uh, before February 24th said that the success of uh, Russian uh, uh, military uh, will be very fast. It didn't happen. It won't happen as well. We, what we can see uh, not uh, only our military success, but also the consolidation of Ukrainian uh, society. Ukraine didn't collapse. Ukraine is going to go on. Uh, do I expect that we will become a member of uh, the EU and NATO? No, because I understand that we cannot be accepted there uh, during the war. Uh, do I expect uh, the fast... Uh, uh, suspension of war from the war? No, because we cannot actually uh, forecast the actions of uh, the Kremlin maniac. Uh, we have to forecast uh, on the rational basis, but there are no rational basis here. Will there be uh, new uh, victims uh, in Ukraine? Unfortunately, yes. I won't load you uh, with uh, figures. 
uh, more than 100 kids in Ukraine died. And this figure uh, all continues to grow. This figure uh, is uh, uh, very worrying for many people because uh, if we combine that with many million of people who left that they had to go uh, temporarily from Ukraine, this testifies that uh, we are in uh, danger of uh, serious demographic, de demographic uh, catastrophe and humanitarian uh, catastrophe. If we remember Mariupol, Chernihiv, uh, Maria will uh, speak about Kharkiv. It's not uh, that effective, uh, affected, but uh, uh, who can tell me that a month ago that rockets uh, will uh, smash Kyiv. I think that uh, uh, there would be just a few people who would say so. And that's why Ukraine uh, continues to surprise. Uh, I can say the main thing. Ukraine uh, uh, finishes the process of uh, uh, formation of Ukrainian political nation and the success uh, of Ukrainian military uh, is uh, crucial here. And uh, we will speak about other aspects uh, in uh, other circles of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can hear you. And uh, I can say that uh, I and Yevhen think in the same way. Uh, speaking about the 23rd uh, of February, uh, we didn't think that there would be uh, the full scale war. Um, what we can see from uh, all this terror, uh, we can see some good news though. As Yevhen already mentioned, we have the nation. And the good thing is uh, that uh, the uh, special uh, uh, forces of uh, Russia. Uh, they are uh, they were corrupted, and uh, their uh, preparation for the war uh, was very bad. And at the same time, uh, Ukrainians uh, were ready to fight, uh, and uh, we uh, also uh, uh, read about uh, anonymous. Uh, uh, documents uh, or some leaks uh, from uh, FSB, uh, and that was a good uh, uh, news for us. And uh, another uh, good news for us uh, is that the second best uh, army in the world showed itself uh, as the circus, acrobatic tr uh, tricks, but uh, not the army that has its uh, echelons of work, uh, the uh, good logistics. Uh, uh, that's why I think that uh, we saw that uh, in order to prepare for war and uh, also to uh, get the conscripts uh, to war uh, have prepared, it was a suicide. And we actually see that this uh, suicide was uh, allowed uh, from the hire of uh, the Kremlin. The bad news is that uh, without uh, actually having uh, ability to win uh, the Ukrainian military, they have to fight uh, the population. And this tendency is going to continue. Uh, for example, yesterday there was a ruined last transporting uh, bridge uh, that joined Chernihiv and Kyiv and uh, other uh, cities with the center of uh, Ukraine. And uh, we can see th and that uh, there will be second Mariupol. They are going to siege this city, um, uh, create a humanitarian crisis in order for us uh, to uh, get to this uh, capitulation. What Lavrov says, and uh, I actually do not see uh, some uh, people like uh, Shoigu or Herasimov. Uh, I hope they are not very good. Anyway, humanitarian uh, crises are going to multiply, unfortunately. And uh, it's very important to consolidate our uh, 
uh, support uh, in the future. Uh, another good news is uh, that uh, in Ukraine, we did not consider the level of solidarity would be that high in Ukraine. We can think about uh, uh, NATO as they are so bad, they did not uh, make a no-fly zone for us. But we also understand the limitations, the political uh, hindrances, uh, and we see the support of uh, the EU, uh, Big Seven, uh, the uh, sanction position, uh, the tension from the West. They all testify that this is a perspective for uh, war in Ukraine. We can actually speak about the name uh, for uh, a lot of time. It's a perspective for the victory in uh, war for Europe. And uh, actually, Kremlin cannot uh, actually uh, imagine what kind of uh, destruction will be uh, for them. Unfortunately, at the same time, we are dying for Europe. And uh, with good support, uh, we hope that uh, uh, the Kremlin will just die out. Thank you very much. If we don't have uh, Maria with us, I don't see her among the participants. Well, then, we're discussing Ukraine today but it's a session of the Belarus Analytical Club. We have Arseniy Sivitsky. It was illogical to invite Arseniy Sivitsky to speak on the military topic and the international relations. So Arseniy, the first question. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me. Possibil possibility to share with you my assessment I will start with most optimistic uh, words. I think that Ukraine, if not if it has not yet came victorious in this war, it will at some point do this. Uh, it has already won morally because the whole world has united, has mobilized to support it. It is both direct and indirect support coming from the world. Not only from the Western world, but also from Asian Pacific countries, including China. We see that uh, in the military sense, uh, Ukraine is on top is winning the war. And uh, I believe uh, we may say that in the next month and a half, the situation will play in the hands of Ukraine and Ukrainians will win further. So we shouldn't exclude the possibility of the, all the future negotiations happening on the conditions of Ukraine, but not the ultimatums that Russia is coming up with. Also, Ukraine may win this war politically. By this, I mean that very serious political social and social transformation inside the country, inside, in case Russia loses the war. Now, well, I'm going to tell you the news that are not so great, but that's the way it is. I believe in the next two, three months, they will be deciding ones. If Ukraine manages to hold strong, to stand, it will be uh, it will be followed by a drastic change in this conflict. Already in April, the campaign on demobilization of uh, Russian military begins. It means that by May and June, about 135 
slash 150,000 of uh, Russian military will leave the army, which means that Russia will face very serious issues with additional reserves that will be available to wage war in Ukraine. We already see that these reserves are running out in a number of military uh, parts of the operation in the south and the east. Russia is already trying to mobilize more, to recruit more military personnel, but they are not particularly successful. And the limit and the limited nature of such resources pushes the Russian uh, authorities to escalation of the military actions, at least for the last uh, couple of months, couple of weeks. We see that over the last month, Russia has run out of the rockets, at least there are three uh, uh, supply of the highly precise weapons, and now it's uh, uh, using the heavy artillery, so which is not that precise, it uses this aviation bomb, air bombs, which leads to the mass casualties and uh, mass destruction of the civil infrastructure and a lot of casualties among the civil population. On this escalation, I believe it is uh, will be happening in the next couple of months with all the consequences, particularly humanitarian sphere. I do not exclude the, that, uh, the fact that in the next couple of weeks, Moscow will try to uh, apply the, the Syrian practice, the approach in Syria, where the surrounded cities will be actively destroyed and bombed to provoke humanitarian crisis happen as a result of such carpet bombing, just like Gennady said. On the other hand, it's done in order to push the Western countries and the Ukrainian authorities to towards negotiations on the conditions of the Kremlin. Also, I uh, believe there's a very good chance, very big chance that the Kremlin will try to, uh, again, assault Kiev and uh, hold a raid on Kiev, it may happen in the next couple of weeks. We see that uh, in Belarus, there's a, a military grouping being formed for this very purpose. These are the bad, this is the bad news that I wanted to share with you. And they showed that we should expect some further escalation of the military activities in the short term. But I also believe that uh, the result of this escalation is uh, unclear. Moreover, if Ukraine gets additional military and technical assistance and aid from the West, not only from the West, In uh, mid-April, the picture will be totally different. The key issue here is supplies of the heavy air defense complexes that uh, will prevent the Russian military from uh, controlling the airspace of Ukraine and it will allow the Ukrainian forces to to counter attack in a number of directions including the 
I believe there are all the prerequisites for the Russian forces that are now in the to the north and to the west of Kiev, they may get into a Uh, may get surrounded, and if uh, more lethal weapons are supplied to Ukrainian forces like anti tank missiles and so on, we may expect that uh, starting from mid April, uh, Ukrainian military forces will be able to counter attack and uh, take the initiative in their own hands. What does this mean for Belarus? It means that in conditions when Russia has uh, run out of supplies and reserves, the Kremlin will be forcing Alexander Lukashenko to take active part or for Belarusian forces to take active part in the military conflict, particularly in case uh, uh, there's a uh, military forces and uh, Russian military forces uh, near Bucha are surrounded. I think this is uh, this may happen in the next 10 to 14 days. And unfortunately, despite the clear, any clear signs that the uh, military want to take part in this military conflict, the, the chance that this scenario will take place is very high just like in case just like it happened uh, when the Belarusian territory was provided to russia to attack ukraine in spite of all the security guarantees that uh, were heard at the top level at the top political level Again, I don't expect any drastic change in favor of Russia if Belarus joins this military conflict against Ukraine. I think it will be the other way around. There will be serious repercussions, uh, political, social repercussions, consequences inside Belarus, because it's obvious that um, Russia is interested in e using Belarusian military forces only as a cannon fodder or it is done, maybe done in order to uh, deblock the forces, uh, Russian military forces outside Bucha and to force the Ukrainian military to spread out. So far, the only thing that has been holding those back from participating in the military conflict has been the understanding that of Lukashenko and the, the country's military management and the catastrophic consequences of Belarus joining this conflict. But unfortunately, we must state that just in case, uh, just like it happened with uh, uh, security guarantees that were violated, were broken. I remember that since 2014, Lukashenko has been repeating this mantra that he would never allow Russian forces to attack Ukraine from Belarusian side. And also the the absence of political will, at least on the surface, to, for Belarus to join the military conflict should be perceived the same way. So there's a high chance of this happening. And finally, if uh, starting from mid-April, if um, by then, the West will supply Ukraine with more weapons and serious decisions will be taken during the talks of Biden and uh, 
nature lies because we know that uh, Biden is uh, right now in Europe. Uh, well, I believe this will mean a drastic change and it could lead to uh, defeat of Russia in this conflict during this turnaround of events. And uh, again, the bad news here is that according to the Russian doctrine documents in such cases when Russia is being defeated, is losing the war, and the Kremlin may apply the tactical nuclear weapons in order to uh, gain advantage in the military conflict. And we see that uh, Moscow has been preparing for the scenario since 19th of February. The uh, nuclear strategic forces were put on high alert. It also shows that this scenario is uh, considered by the Kremlin. But if this option is applied, if the tactical nuclear weapon is applied, which uh, well, was supposed to supposedly will uh, have psychological effect on the Ukraine, on international community in the West in order to force the Ukraine and the West to capitulate, to give up. I don't see any chances of Russia uh, emerging victorious in this, from this conflict because we, for a long time, we have been witnessing a lot of uh, splits in the Russian establishment, Russian elites. And uh, it's not only about the uh, Russian oligarchs and uh, or any civil servants. It's uh, already about the military authorities. And the last couple of days, uh, we've stopped hearing from the Minister of Defense of Russia and uh, some of his colleagues. It, it is a, it's a sign that indeed the in, internal situation is very tense in Russia in terms of uh, and on the background of the failure of the so-called special operation that Russia is conducting in Ukraine, there's a high chance that the uh, uh, Kremlin will have to rotate people, human resources, and replace some people. And this is my personal opinion. I believe that the defeat of Russia in this war is conditioned by the fact that the Russian army was not ready to such a conflict. If we look at the rhetoric of Vladimir Putin and other officials of his administration, we will come to the conclusion that just in case, so just, just like it happened in Afghanistan when Soviet forces were sent there, the decision was taken without any deep consultations with the military bloc. Just like uh, in the case of the Afghan war, when the great influence on the decision was made by the KGB, we see here again the great, very big influence of FSB and uh, foreign service. And also the foreign intelligence services and not the military as such. I think that when Russia was concentrating its forces around Ukraine, the military uh, commanders had a scenario of 
entry in Ukraine and that is under control of the separate republic, the NRNLNR, and uh, they will be fighting with Ukrainian forces up there. So the, that presence should, should have played a psychological role rather than really create an active threat to security of Ukrainian, uh, of the Ukrainian state. I believe that the decision of Vladimir Putin to declare to start the special operation was uh, uh, came out of the blue for the mil Russian military commanders, hence all the issues that Russian forces are facing and have been facing in the last month. So we see there's an absence of tactics. Thank you very much. We need to uh, round it up because we have some more experts here uh, that are, would like to speak. So we see the problems that the Russian forces encountered in the first couple of weeks, like the absence of the engineering support, engineering training, medical support. Hence the losses the Russian army suffered, about 50 slash 60,000 Russian military suffered were dead or injured. It means that one third of the of the military grouping around Ukraine is um, already out of the game. So we, I uh, wish all the successes and further success to our military, to our Ukrainian friends. And I wish um, to emerge victorious in this war. Thank you very much. Artem, indeed, indeed, well, time is running out. Maria Abdiva can hear us and she will join us in about five minutes. Let's now discuss the second question about the influence of war in Ukraine on Belarus, because we we also trying to think in the, for the long term. And the, the, the lot of scenarios that we have seen, like the presence of Russian forces and Belarus and many other things. Many years ago, we discussed the potential appearance of uh, Russian military camps, but we never expected that Russian military will simply come to Belarus. But also, oh, we may have t some place for optimism because the Putin's regime is highly supportive of Lukashenko and his regime. So it's very interesting to understand what our Ukrainian colleagues think about this. I don't, I don't know if Gennady is with us. If he's not, not with us, I uh, give floor to Evgeny. Uh, the question of uh, Belarus is uh, uh, really uh, when we speak uh, in the expert environment, uh, uh, then everyone understands and uh, actually knows each other pretty well. Accordingly, uh, we need to speak honestly, uh, transparently things. Uh, I'm not speaking about uh, the rules of house. Uh, I'm uh, not uh, hiding my position. Uh, the uh, war makes uh, perception black and white. And uh, it's not a surprise that according to a uh, rating agency, 85% uh, uh, of uh, Ukrainians see uh, Belarus as hostile because uh, uh, we have missiles, 
aircraft uh, from the territory of Belarus. We also have troops coming in uh, to Kiev. Uh, I can uh, list uh, these uh, facts, but I won't. I think that uh, as of today, we are not in this uh, red thin uh, line, but between uh, two white uh, big stripes uh, where we have a big red uh, one. Uh, what I'm talking about, uh, we have uh, uh, the Lukashenko, uh, who is uh, Putin's accomplice. And everyone who saw uh, footage on Mariupol, anyone who saw the missiles bombing uh, Kiev, anyone uh, who saw uh, these uh, killed children, they will understand that I am right. However, the direct participation uh, so far hypothetical, this hypothesis has been around for four weeks already uh, from the first day uh, it, this information was uh, there that uh, belarusian uh, belarusian tro troops uh, came in about this direct involvement of belarus at least uh, there were two provocations uh, there was shelling uh, of uh, uh, aircraft of belarusian ter ter territory from the ukrainian side by russian aircraft by before they came, we have uh, this uh, separation for Lukashenko and those who obey his orders. We understand that this could be uh, tens or hundreds of people, but later we have a bigger problem, a direct participation of Belarusian uh, uh, troops uh, as the invasion uh, troops and uh, making uh, this uh, war uh, uh, between Rus uh, Russia and Ukraine, but uh, making, uh, transforming it uh, into a bigger uh, issue, uh, which will spoil uh, our relationships, will ruin our relationships for decades to come. Many citizens of Ukraine do not know that tens of thousands of uh, Belarusians uh, immigrated uh, abroad. Many don't know that uh, there are a lot of political prisoners in uh, Belarus. It's true. But uh, look, war makes us uh, look at uh, things black and white. On my part, I uh, try to convey uh, the uh, Belarus, Belarusian uh, uh, viewers or listeners uh, uh, such things. We haven't had war. Uh, uh, any time, at least uh, from the time when we know ourselves as Ukrainians and Belarusians. Uh, but uh, we also know that uh, it uh, takes experience. It is a key factor uh, and uh, it is a myth of uh, a grand Russian army was ruined by the experienced Ukrainian uh, troops uh, having uh, been uh, in this uh, Donetsk uh, region. We have eight year experience, which was uh, successfully uh, utilized uh, in the scale of uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, expanding to the aviation as a component of this war. Another thing that uh, needs to be taken into account what do Belarusians have to fight for in Ukraine, for the Nazification of Ukraine? <laughs> we can speak about the Nazification of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Belarus uh, Israel, and Poland, because everywhere the victims of uh, Nazi people. At, uh, okay, uh, Israel uh, was not a country then, but uh, on our uh, territories. We had millions of victims. I cannot actually uh, imagine the Nazification uh, of a country where uh, uh, pre the president of the Jewish origin is. Explain that to me. So as of today, this wide uh, red stripe exists. 
I understand that uh, the recent uh, events, uh, they are on the diplomatic level, uh, not in the diplomatic front. Uh, they allow us uh, to say uh, about uh, the new confrontation uh, and escalation. And uh, it's uh, not uh, that uh, Lukashenko, my friend, just gave a book to me. Uh, no, but uh, according to his uh, aggressive rhetorics, I'm not going to speak about rhetorics of Lukashenko, you know it for better, but I think that with this aggressive rhetoric, he uh, wants to uh, substitute uh, the uh, uh, direct involvement of uh, Belarusian uh, troops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvian. I agree. It's uh, much easier for Lukashenko to support Putin in words that indeed send his military to Ukraine and face consequences. Right, so Gennady is with us. Gennady, the floor is yours, please. What do you think about the consequences for Belarus? And uh, now let's talk more about the So now let's speak uh, about how is the war in Ukraine going to affect the situation in Belarus. So uh, it's good for you and uh, Yevgen and uh, Maria and myself we uh, all uh, worked uh, in our research uh, with uh, Belarus. I have an impression that uh, the uh, point of no return that uh, came uh, from uh, Russia that uh, went uh, into Ukraine, and it's been uh, almost a month uh, of it. And we actually see that uh, there could be a break in the situation, and uh, there was a break in the paradigm of thinking, uh, military speaking uh, even. But uh, even now, we already have this uh, point of no return for Belarus and for Lukashenko, even if he is not directly involved by uh, a boot uh, on the territory of Ukraine by his uh, own troops. Uh, but uh, all his steps, like uh, uh, allowing the territory uh, uh, missiles launches from the, his uh, territory. He understands that uh, for him, there will be no return for the moment of February 23. We understand that uh, the situation is, and uh, uh, he has a lot of challenges. You should understand uh, how uh, you have to keep the situation uh, to, uh, to be good in the country, how not to be involved uh, into this uh, war, because he understands all the consequences uh, of him uh, uh, grasping the power. Uh, I will uh, remind you that he is a self-proclaimed -pro uh, uh, president. But uh, also the scale uh, of involvement uh, could be as big as uh, a Russian one, because we all understand. Uh, maybe Arseny will uh, object to me, but still, uh, I can see that uh, similarity is uh, very big. Uh, we can actually see uh, how these troops are ground, how they are burned in their uh, semi-working tanks and uh, armored vehicles and uh, uh, any other um, vehicles, we uh, actually see that uh, th that will be awaiting for Belarusian uh, troops. We can see that uh, the uh, Lukashenko, uh, Lukashists, uh, uh, troops, they, they are not that motivated, uh, so to say, but uh, all these uh, victims uh, can be demotivated uh, afterwards. So the reality for them is different. And uh, all this new essence that uh, we have to take uh, together uh, and uh, so as not to have some uh, internal uh, situations, uh, so as to keep uh, the nation uh, uh, solid, uh, on the other hand, uh, not to uh, die as a country uh, and uh, to continue working as a state, uh, as an army, not to die in this uh, war. Uh, so far, the situation is not clear. So 
I think that uh, now the uh, dilemma that the dictator has uh, probably has uh, even uh, more challenges uh, than that uh, that uh, the Kremlin uh, dictator has. Unfortunately, uh, even with this uh, sanction uh, pressures, uh, with this wave that can be uh, can sweep him away. Uh, I cannot see that for Russia, but uh, in Belarus, uh, I can actually see it. And I mean, Lukashenko and influences uh, his decisions uh, a lot. I think that uh, there will be a big uh, um, uh, a, a attitude uh, uh, that, and uh, probability that Lukashenko troops will uh, join uh, this war on the territory uh, to the territory of Ukraine, but uh, it won't have any big uh, influence because the number of battalion and tactical groups that will come here with this red square on uh, their armor, they will not change anything because the preparedness of Ukrainians is very big. They know where they will come, uh, how many of them will come, and they are sure how to uh, implement their scenarios, what to do with this. There will be pressure. There will be uh, escalation uh, on this, but uh, uh, see, uh, there will be more challenges uh, for Lukashenko than they, there were before. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, we have Marina Avdeva joining us. I'm very glad to see you online. And I know that you don't have much time, so the floor is yours. Let's start. Let's go back to the first question. What Ukraine should expect to happen in the next couple of months? And I, I hope you will add what you think about prospects of Belarus. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see everyone. Today we're collecting um, the proof of the Russian forces uh, military violations of the law, um, crimes. Uh, I'm back at home because it's six o'clock. Uh, we need to go back. I heard a little bit of your discussion. Some people say that uh, the, our victory is coming soon, but uh, uh, today we were shelled the whole day and I believe that there's a long time until the uh, situation gets normal. So I, I think we should discuss what it will happen after war, but uh, where I am now, the main concern is how to survive because we get shelled every day. And uh, today we have uh, we had a, a line of people shelled by the Russian Grad. As to the question, what we should expect in the next couple of months, I believe that the Russian forces will continue their tactics because uh, militarily they cannot solve the questions that the issues that they they were trying to solve uh, and achieve their goals. So the tactics they're using now is to terrorize the uh, local population, the civilians, they're constantly shelling and creating humanitarian crisis as deep as they can in the biggest number of places. While in the past, there was illusion that in the first day of award that uh, only military facilities will be shelled. Now it's obvious that the First and foremost, they'll be shelling the civilian facilities and uh, the regular people. It is happening in front of our eyes and we need to be ready uh, for this to continue. In Kharkov the, last night, uh, we uh, were shelled by the Kaliber missile that was launched from the Black Sea. And it was such a huge explosion that 
I felt uh, the way from it three kilometers away. I uh, think it will continue. I don't think that anything will change because uh, Russia is 40 kilometers from Kharkov. So why not sh continue shelling and terrorizing us, and shelling uh, kindergarten schools and hospitals, which means that 1.5 million people have moved to a different place now. I'm in the same city, which means that the, uh, all the facilities will close down. And there'll be crisis in the agriculture and all other spheres. And uh, the sewing campaign will not start. I think they're counting on this. And the second question was uh, uh, about the prospects for Belarus, right? Yes. We know that uh, a lot of negative scenarios and a lot of positive scenarios. Some people say that Russia and Belarus will be freed from the this dictatorship yoke, uh, some others. What do you think will happen in the region? The control over Belarus has been tightening the side of Russia, and Russia is using Belarus as its military base. I have repeated this, that Poland and the Baltic states are also vulnerable and under threat because, in fact, they are bordering Russia now because the, the border has moved westward. And talking about Belarus as a sovereign independent state is barely possible, hardly possible. I would consider Belarus a satellite of Russia. I think Putin is capable of solving all the issues he's facing from using the territory of Belarus and using Lukashenko until he needs him. I think the issue of uh, Belarusian military entering Ukraine is t tactical because if Putin wanted it to happen today, it would have happened. I don't think Lukashenko can bypass this issue or somehow uh, not follow Putin's orders. I think there are some agreements between them. If it's needed, this will be done and the Belarusian forces will be sent to Ukraine to fight. I also think that this is not the scenario Lukashenko would want, but Lukashenko is now in this situation when nothing depends on his desires and opinions. What should Belarusians expect? The same thing that all other countries should expect, the countries that are neighboring Russia, uh, Russia that started the Third World War. What should Belarus expect from uncontrolled fires uh, happening outside the Chernobyl NPP? There could be a um, nuclear explosion. What should we expect from the country like Russia, who says they're ready to apply the chemical weapons? The same thing we all should expect. We should say that we, Belarusians, can do and should do something. Uh, they have been kidnapped. They are hostages of uh, Lukashenko. The people who are neutral right now, I think they should. We should uh, tell them that uh, the time when they should expect something and wait for something is over. The time of being neutral is over. It's impossible to be neutral these days. Or like some journalists from Belarus wrote me that let's listen to both sides. There, there are no two sides now. 
I, I, need, I think people should understand this, that they're either on the side of a Nazi state, the Third, Fourth Reich, that is uh, waging war against the free world, you're either on this side or you're either on the other side that is defending itself. There are no two sides now that you can neutrally discuss. Because if the evil wins, and I hope it doesn't, but hypothetically, everyone will perish and die. So uh, we should put to the side our neutrality and uh, clearly protect the free world and the good against the bad, against the evil. I hope that people uh, who still think that they be on the sidelines and wait for it to end. I think they should understand it's no longer possible to stay neutral because it's uh, fraught with extreme danger. And people who are hostages to Lukashenko's regime, regime, if you want to remain alive, if you want your houses stay intact, unlike those in my city. If you want your city families to stay intact, unlike those in Ukraine and Russia, you need to do your best to prevent Lukashenko's forces to enter from entering Ukraine. Because Lukashenko is the associate of Putin, an ally of Putin. But uh, the, this last step remains that needs to be avoided and prevented. The issue for me is clear now. Either the whole world helps us to defeat Russia and will rebuild the world like uh, we did after the defeat of, of Germany, it ended with the uh, restructuring of Germany and the pain reparations and or Russia will uh, face the same destiny as Germany did. Nuremberg Tribunal, some people execute, show themselves, some were hanged. So I think we should consider this scenario because I still hear a lot of people saying that we should stay on the side and that we cannot influence the situation. Those people who want to influence the situation, they do participate in the struggle. And I urge you to take part in this struggle against evil. Thank you very much. Indeed, everyone is doing everything they can. So if, if tomorrow I cannot force Lukashenko away from his position, it doesn't mean that I cannot do something. You spoke about this scenario. You said that if Russia wins, everybody dies, that if Ukraine wins, that there'll be repayments. But what do you think will be the scenario for Belarus? Let's say, if we uh, fight together against Russia, what will be the bright future for us? Is this a question to me? Yes. Yeah, can you add something about this? We, we just mentioned negative scenarios. Uh, let's uh, mention the positive scenario. At the beginning of the Third World War, it's difficult to talk about the positive scenario. Uh, for now, it's difficult for me to say what positive could be if we still we're facing mass executions, people dying, children dying. I can say that it will end with the collapse of Russia. It may not be as fast as we wanted to see. I don't see that tomorrow uh, Russia will raise their hands and uh, 
say that they, we agree that uh, we give up because the crazy dictator will not probably do this since the, he already started this war. So the scenarios may vary. And I think they're outside of our planning horizon because there are a lot of unclear patches and things that we cannot predict. If we four rounds of talks are behind her, further talks will happen. There can be some agreements on uh, temporary ceasefire, or they may not be anything like this. So again, we need we don't see any signs that it will happen in very soon. So the people already have a blood in their hands. They're not going to stop right away because they've crossed all the lines, all the borders. Recently, I spoke with the, one of the legion experts, uh, uh, humanitarian, illegal, uh, humanitarian law, uh, because the military criminals are not only the people who give orders, but also who fulfill those orders. Now we have a lot of people uh, who are connected with this blood. Lukashenko and his military are among those people. They understand very well that there's no way back for them, that they're covered with blood. Just like all uh, serial killers and maniacs, they know that they will uh, get uh, capital punishment, execution, so why stop? I don't think they'll just stop and say, fine, we have killed uh, 1,500 people, 1,500 civilians. We believe we should stop here. I think they will continue. So I would like to repeat that there will not be a, it will not happen that Russia will say that we have lost. It will happen if everybody will join their efforts and help Ukraine as much as they can. And if Belarusians will help Ukraine, then we'll be able to say that we have forced Russia to stop military aggression against Ukraine. Great, thank you. Maria Deva, Arseny, uh, wants to comment on this. Thank you, Maria. Please stay with us as long as you can. Maybe there'll be a third question. It's already curfew, so I cannot go outside. It's now the same question as to Arsenia, the prospects of Belarus. I understand we spoke, we asked Ukrainians about the Belarus specifics. So what uh, are the prospects? In case one of the parties wins, how do you think it will affect the situation in Belarus? Here I can see a pessimistic scenario because uh, from the point of view of international community and international law, Belarus is not just a associate, associate, an accomplice. It's a side of the aggression. Because, of course, there are a lot of different uh, definitions and uh, coming from various journalists, uh, politicians from the West. But if we look at the, the resolution of the General Assembly, UN General Assembly from 1974, I think it's number 33.14. It uh, defines the act of aggression, among other things, as the voluntary provision of the territories to a third state to conduct military activities against the third, against another state. So if we look at the sanctions that are being introduced against Belarus, 
by Western states and their allies and the commercial companies. We'll see that uh, basically uh, they do not really separate Russia and Belarus. The sanctions package is simply affecting Belarus as, as well. There is a It's clear that the international community perceives Belarus as an associate here, as an accomplice. It means that in case Ukraine wins in this war, and I think it will happen, Ukraine will emerge victorious. And so far we have seen all the preconditions for this. It will be a catastrophe for Belarus not only as a state, but also the society, because paying for the mistakes of the Belarusian authorities, I mean, Belarusians will have to do this. We see already that some Belarusians living outside, they're already facing various kinds of and forms of discrimination just because they are somehow related to the state of Belarus. I'm not even mentioning here the catast catastrophic consequences from the point of view of uh, repayments and reparations. International tribunal, the international tribunal is gaining pace and uh, Charges have been put, imposed on Russia for breaking, uh, violating the humanitarian law and other and others. And it's only a matter of time uh, when similar charges will be imposed again on Belarus. Whatever our take on situation, the participation of Belarus in Bel in this war is counterproductive from the point of view of Belarus developing as a successful sovereign state, let alone the sanctions. This year alone, according to the forecast of Belarusian national experts, the Belarus GDP will go down by 15% and uh, eventually could be much worse including all the prospects for the social, political and economic stability. But I think that Belarus still ha has a possibility to minimize the losses of participating in this conflict. And I'm not, I don't mean here that the Belarus and military forces will or will not participate in this conflict. It does not change the qualification of our participation in this conflict. We uh, have already been recognized and as one of the aggressor sides, but the, there are things that help us can help us redeem us. Uh, ourselves and minimize the economic losses. For this, to do this, we need to discuss the illegal presence of Russian forces in Belarus, both uh, due to the violation of the constitution, previous on the current one, and uh, bilateral relations according to which Russian forces may stay in Belarus for no longer than two months. And finally, we should examine the facts of uh, Russia violating these promises about uh, withdrawing its forces from Belarus after the uh, joint military exercises, because according to the previous agreements announced uh, by the Vladimir Makiev, Foreign Minister of Belarus and representatives of the Russian 
um, defense ministry they should have started with joint military forces uh, from belarus on 22nd of february again i would like to bring up the resolution of the general assembly number 33.14 from 1974 which says that if the foreign military present in the in our country is happening uh, in violation of the all previous agreements and uh, terms it could also be seen as an act of military aggression so we are currently in the situation when uh, there's a window of opportunity to requalify our status in this conflict and not be uh, an aggressive state but uh, be a state which has been subject to aggression on the 22nd of february when the kremlin decided not to withdraw its forces and also to start military actions against ukraine without any approval of and permission of the belarusian side I'm not even talking about uh, I'm not, not saying even that uh, this could involve some special statements that could look like a letter sent to the secretariat of of the end general assembly again this may come be accompanied by the introduction of the peace contingent that could be placed on the deployed on the border of belarus and ukraine uh, it could help to stabilize the situation because if Belarus did not allow Russian forces to enter its territory, we would not have seen this military operation unraveling because the major direction of the Russian forces movement originated, unfortunately, in Belarus. So if it was not possible for Russian forces to attack from Belarus, we may never have seen this conflict. Some people are asking about the scenarios that you're offering. If Belarus is considered the victim of the aggression, So I'll repeat, what will, what status will Lukashenko's regime will get if uh, Belarus is considered a victim? Well, actually it depends on his actions, his steps and his statements. Indeed, I heard the question. It depends on the concrete actions of Lukashenko and uh, at the level of rhetoric and concrete actions. We're not preventing Russia from using our territory to undertake uh, military actions. It puts uh, the military the the Belarusian authorities on the same side with the Russians. The question here is how to minimize our losses because the Belarus as if it considered an aggressor country, it's not like uh, 
Lukashenko is considering the aggressor. It means that the Belarusian society will have to pay for the to Ukraine for a long time. So I believe that we still have this small window of opportunity before Russia will finally decide to escalate the conflict, put it into a new phase. I expect this to happen in the next two weeks. So we do have a window of opportunity to uh, voice our position and to try to save the, our, our face. Thank you. For me, there are some factors that I consider that impossible to overcome. So I believe again that I will not never get a pension in Belarus, but I have a feeling that uh, we may have to pay higher taxes that be a repayment uh, for Belarus joining the, this military conflict because the damage has already been done to Ukraine. It needs to be compensated and Belarus needs to assume this responsibility, even though my personal position is really far away from that of Lukashenko. I see some more questions about the participation of people and society in this. Let's discuss the third question, namely what uh, lessons for the international system of security. Let's discuss this. We saw that the international system of national security was built on the aftermath of the world wars, the first world war and the second world war, the League of Nations and so on. Hopefully we'll not need the third world war in order to change something. And the whole world will think and that something needs to be done, that current system is wrong. What do you think should be the lessons learned here for the international security system? What needs to be changed after the war is over in order to avoid this happening in the future? Nadi, please. Uh, my friend, uh, is it uh, only me that uh, war in Ukraine, war in Ukraine, uh, I'm not picking on this, uh, but we all understand that uh, it's not only about war in Ukraine, it's also the segment of global uh, section, what's uh, wrong with the world. Yeah, so uh, by the war in Ukraine, I mean that uh, now uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, army of course, is uh, in I mean counter attack. By war in Ukraine, I mean that uh, not the civil war in Ukraine. Uh, I agree uh, what Maria said. It's very difficult uh, when I heard my colleagues, uh, but uh, I was distracted uh, to some of the things and uh, because of their reality persists. Uh, I still have my uh, parents uh, in uh, uh, Chernihiv and uh, I uh, actually uh, asked uh, their grandfather, uh, my grandson to call uh, my uh, parents. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, globally, now the price that is paid by all the international actors uh, is the price that uh, many times uh, bigger that uh, had to be uh, done uh, at the time of uh, uh, prevention. So the lesson learned, uh, the le lesson of prevention uh, could have been 
cheaper uh, because uh, when it comes to this uh, new one, chemical, biological, or uh, nuclear, uh, that uh, is a threat to your cities. You have to understand that uh, you uh, have to uh, work uh, in advance. You have to work uh, all together. And there has to be this lesson learned. And uh, we have a lot of questions to NATO. We can uh, hear uh, what our president says. Uh, uh, look, our uh, president uh, is uh, quite popular and he speaks uh, uh, a lot of uh, good and dry things and uh, he got a lot of support. And uh, now uh, he says, look at you, uh, look at your muscles. Uh, we just uh, need 1% uh, of tanks uh, to protect our territory and you cannot give it to us because you do not have the uh, system uh, about pre prevention of this. So uh, of solidarity. So uh, the lesson learned has to be uh, about the solidarity uh, to be uh, realized. But the threat was uh, for the countries of NATO uh, as well. Uh, the third situation that uh, has to be learned, and we have to uh, think about uh, this uh, all, there are windows of opportunities uh, I spoke uh, in the beginning uh, that uh, in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, some kind of uh, rise uh, of uh, citizenship society, uh, all the population. We have uh, this messiah uh, attitude uh, just uh, to uh, kill this cockroach. I'm not speaking about the Belarusian one, but more uh, as uh, Russian. Uh, we uh, see here the window of opportunities and we take all the efforts possible, diplomatic, military one. We just need to uh, make this monument uh, closer. And the same refers to Belarus. Uh, we can actually see what is happening about postponing this uh, bad war. The connection is not very good. Gennady, can you hear us better now? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, probably do not use uh, video. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it works. So I'm saying that uh, it's a window of opportunities uh, and we do our job. And uh, Evgen and Maria, they can uh, also uh, say that uh, people who never worked uh, in humanitarian issues, they uh, now are involved in it and uh, they help out. Now I'm speaking about Belarus. Uh, it's a big dilemma for the dictator how not to be involved uh, uh, all together uh, there, uh, how to um, be safe. But uh, it's also about uh, the uh, citizenship uh, society, both for those people who uh, live in Belarus now and those who had to leave um, in Belarus. Uh, what you have uh, to do uh, so as uh, to make this uh, dictatorship disappear. So all the lesson has to be learned. If we see the weakness of this uh, regime, it has to be uh, beaten at. Uh, may, maybe some information work, political uh, activities, uh, what uh, these uh, democratic forces do. And uh, it's up to you, Belarus, uh, to decide. And, uh, uh, the main thing is uh, also uh, the interaction between our societies, the lesson that we have to learn. Now we also uh, work at the uh, thing that we need to render, to convey the uh, information that uh, we uh, actually uh, do not want to be in the war with you Belarusians. Uh, 
and uh, actually maybe to find some lines of cooperation uh, in the humanitarian uh, front, uh, for example, to work together. Uh, there could be uh, also uh, some humanitarian projects uh, in uh, Ukraine. Please join. Uh, do you remember uh, Chernihiv? Uh, and uh, actually, uh, there is not much left there. And uh, actually, if you chip in and uh, if you uh, send uh, 50 or 100 uh, euros, don't wait uh, for these reparations. Uh, look for some uh, possibilities uh, to uh, help uh, people who are um, willing to survive. And it's not a figure of speech. Uh, we are neighbors and uh, let us work uh, together. And uh, I really would like to uh, hear you, Belarusians, uh, how we can resist together. We are ready to help you wherever you need our help. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, uh, the in. Thank you very much. I, I think I missed some of your reply, but I will uh, definitely re watch the video uh, if we speak about uh, global conclusions in general uh, as a historian by background it's uh, interesting to live uh, in the uh, inside of some uh, historical events it's a challenge but uh, you cannot actually preserve uh, objectivity our objectivity will be concluded from a complex of uh, different uh, subjectivities but I will try to be a scientist first and uh, to tell what the reasons are uh, that the world won't be able to pass for previous weeks. First of all, this war is uh, the biggest uh, country in the world against the biggest country in Europe. And whoever wants to be uh, the leader uh, in the world and uh, when they want to make uh, uh, alliances and they have to react to this. If they do not react, uh, they are dead. If they uh, are, do not react to the distresses of such a strength, they do not exist. Another thing that could be interesting for the uh, Belarusian uh, society is the um, a confrontation between uh, two former Soviet uh, republics. Russia uh, tries to destroy our infrastructure and uh, they uh, just destroy the perspectives of a successful Ukraine because successful Ukraine is the most dangerous thing for Russia, for any Russia. It uh, doesn't matter for uh, Putin's Russia or whoever's Russia. Another thing. This is so obvious that you cannot pass it, the nuclear factor. Non-nuclear uh, uh, state uh, as uh, Ukraine that refused from nuclear uh, uh, arms uh, became a victim of uh, a, a nuclear uh weapons uh, uh country so uh, i ask uh, the uh, world uh, leaders how can you actually make sure that other countries can uh, actually uh, de be deprived of uh, these uh, nuclear uh, arms uh, another thing is uh, nuclear blackmail what is the difference uh, between uh, the uh, nuke uh, a bomb uh, going off uh, or uh, opening uh, up the confinement of the Chernobyl uh, Chernobyl uh, nuclear uh, station or Zaporizhia uh, uh, power station. Uh, is it going to kill differently this radiation people? No, not really. Another thing, well, both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, they uh, are uh, they work uh, a lot uh, at grain and uh, already the uh, Chinese leader uh, spoke that uh, uh, rice has to be provided uh, uh, to uh, China and uh, Ukraine uh, actually was uh, the provider of China. 
Uh, another uh, thing uh, is uh, navigation. Uh, today, uh, Russia lost Orsk uh, ship, and this equation uh, is uh, taken away from it. And many people will think uh, differently uh, about uh, this uh, navigation. So, uh, I just asked uh, uh, to speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not speaking as uh, a scientist, but uh, as a person uh, from Ukraine. Ukraine uh, will become a contributor uh, to European uh, safety uh, by fact. It proved right that uh, it was able uh, to confront the second uh, biggest army in the world. We don't need this gunpowder rating to prove that the uh, Ukrainian army, as of today, is one of the strongest in Europe. And uh, it is indirectly uh, proves uh, from the passive position from NATO and the EU with uh, uh, all this uh, interconnection. That's why I think that uh, uh, this uh, national motto, Ukraine, uh, above everything uh, uh, after the war is over uh, will be realized geopolitically thank you very much for this patriotic uh, but at the same time very interesting forecast based on facts thank you maria is still with us the floor is yours what are your expectations about uh, how it will influence the system of international security what would changes will be needed? Uh, I think that uh, it's difficult to say um, because uh, all of you know that uh, uh, Russia also uh, threatens Poland uh, with the attack. And uh, actually uh, there were uh, some uh, blasts uh, very close uh, to uh, Poland. Uh, 20 kilometers uh, or so, uh, and uh, they are just uh, testing what they will do. And uh, actually, this is being discussed. So uh, probably it's quite early to think about uh, this uh, post-war safety negotiations, because we do not uh, see uh, on the horizon another country that uh, Russia is going to attack and what uh, the NATO reaction will be. So uh, now I think that uh, for sure uh, their guarantees will be uh, reviewed because the world uh, order uh, was uh, broken uh, after the World War II. And now we will need to build everything from the scratch. And how it will be built, uh, we'll see. We'll see uh, as long as uh, where we will get to this um, uh, after this war. Uh, I will uh, support my colleagues. Uh, so this is not war of Ukraine and uh, not uh, the war in Ukraine. It's Russia uh, against all. And uh, everybody needs to think uh, what system of safety and guarantees of safety will be. I know that uh, President Zelensky uh, signed and uh, now we have this uh, process uh, launched to the EU and uh, it's a symbolic uh, step, but it's important uh, because uh, there will be some uh, bilateral uh, relationships uh, or guarantees of safety. Uh, also, uh, this uh, cooperation uh, will be strengthened uh, and uh, something will be changed uh, in the field of uh, safety. Uh, something that NATO could have given uh, in the format of bilateral uh relationships uh, we still understand that there will be a rebuilding of the world order in principle we are in the center of the funnel that uh, takes in everything and from this very funnel uh, 
uh, to uh, foresee what is going to happen in the future is very difficult. And I would like to uh, ask uh, the Belarusians how they see their role, because more often I see some kind of uh, uh, being uh, aloof and uh, uh, we, uh, we'll see how everything works out, and then we'll see what our role is. Uh, first uh, of all, I'm uh, speaking about uh, people who have to be uh, on the territory of Belarus, but still, it's uh, important uh, now for everybody to turn on and to call uh, uh, spade a spade and uh, to uh, get up, not as being a patriotic or not uh, that uh, you uh, personally support Ukraine, but uh, also because this is the uh, matter of survival and matter of safety. Thank you very much. I think Arseniy already said that if we just um, wait, um, and not, do not act now, we'll end up paying, rep, uh, repaying Ukraine and paying more. Uh, Arseniy, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, sure. Uh, many uh, already uh, mentioned that the, the international uh, system of safety is in crisis. And I think that uh, if Russia uh, loses this war, that, uh, then we will have a new round of uh, long uh, uh, negotiations on strategical uh, stability in the 1970s uh, of the first Helsinki uh, process. There will be an attempt uh, to renew, uh, reactualize these uh, uh, agreements. Uh, INF uh, Treaty, uh, uh, Vienna document, but uh, uh, under the conditions that Russia will have to accept the uh, requirements that uh, will be forced by the international community and Ukraine. I think that the main lesson uh, from uh, Russian war uh, against Ukraine is uh, that Ukraine won't need any guarantees. Actually, we will uh, ask to uh, uh, get guarantees from Ukraine because from the recipient of safety, Ukraine uh, will turn uh, into a donor of safety with uh, the uh, second uh, best uh, uh, military uh, might, not only in Europe, but in the world. Uh, here, I would like to concentrate what it means for Belarus and uh, what we can expect from this. Uh, this uh, inevitable, um, uh, loss of uh, Russia in this war uh, will lead uh, to uh, losing uh, the influence of Russia in many fronts. So I see that uh, this uh, possibility and uh, our moral obligation uh, after that uh, bad role that we played in this conflict, it is a transition to a really neutral status and uh, it will also be uh, our contribution to new European system of safety uh, after the conflict is over. So I see that uh, being neutral is uh, our role and uh, our salvation in the future. So as to carry a lesser burden for uh, our participation in this aggression.
I saw that a lot of questions. Will uh, Andrei Labruchin? Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you very much for your expert opinions and assessment. I asked two questions to Evgeny and Maria. They are the same. I'll just read them once again. It's no secret that the Belarusian society is, is split, and you also acknowledge that the Belarusian state is in many ways conditionally independent. It's like a pseudo sovereignty. By doing this, by saying so, you partially recognize the fact that Belarusian, the Belarusian society is one thing, and the Belarusian institutions and apparatus connected to Lukashenko is something else. I asked this question. Uh, in the, currently, in the war conditions, as Evgeny said, many things are black and white, but even in these conditions, there are people who are risking their lives in the battlefields. We know that there are people who are actively volunteering, who are uh, still in prison for their convictions and their statements against the war. So why is it impossible to have a different attitude to different countries of Belarus and different Belarusian citizens? One of them being an institution that Latushka calls occupation. The other one is, uh, which is as consolidated around the Lukashenko's regime and is responsible directly for the waging of war. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. I will add to this. And basically, the question is, what do we lack now to um, for Ukrainians to see the split? Because in here, in experts, we do understand how much regime is different to other Belarusians. Particularly some Belarusians are doing their best for Ukraine. What else do we need for this split to be seen in Ukrainian society or for it to be seen in the future? Because it's difficult to discern details now during the war, but what else is needed for the future? Question to Evgeny. You see, uh, I already mentioned uh, what uh, Ukrainians uh, see, and uh, we had a joke. Uh, uh, what is Ukraine like by uh, the Moscovite's uh, eyes? I think that Ukrainians now, uh, due to different reasons, they uh, cannot explain uh, people with a Belarusian uh, passport, the uh, attitude, uh, reasons. Uh, those uh, who dig uh, in deeper, uh, they uh, understand. Uh, and we already mentioned, and uh, Vadim, uh, Maria Gennady, uh, we already mentioned that. But uh, this uh, position uh, has to be carried by uh, the representatives of uh, Belarusian uh, opposition but uh, uh, maybe not from the state, maybe uh, people uh, from art, uh, for example, uh, Alexievich, who uh, addresses people. You see, I'm not going to list uh, between uh, the allies, because uh, I uh, would say that uh, our uh, Ukrainian military is not going to uh, differentiate between the uh, oppressors' uh, grades, but uh, those uh, representatives uh, of uh, Belarusian uh, 
community uh, have to speak themselves because uh, myself uh, as a representative of Ukrainian uh, society, I uh, have to overcome uh, the uh, hindrances and uh, different barriers. Uh, I am for discussion. Uh, I have uh, uh, a lot uh, to think uh, about it, but uh, the first shock of uh, first days of war uh, changed uh, a lot. Uh, this uh, discussion will go on. Uh, I don't have any limitations, uh, uh, so as not we do not uh, discuss anything with Belarusians. But to start, Uh, for your information, uh, I'm not speaking uh, about uh, uh, something that uh, I did that and uh, now I uh, it's my fault. Uh, I want uh, the uh, Belarusian society uh, to think and to speak out uh, who we are, uh, what are we for, what do we need to do about it, and then Ukrainian society will be able to uh, carry and uh, put the instruments uh, to it. Thank you. Can I say something? Um, in those battalion, there were really people who died, uh, casualties. Is it shows that Belarusians are also sacrificing themselves. also addressed to Maria. Maria, please. Yes, uh, I have uh, something to answer on this, uh, whether the uh, Ukrainians uh, are uh, split uh, in experts. Uh, yes, for, uh, for, uh, for sure uh, not. Uh, Belarus has to uh, understand that precisely. If uh, uh, Belarus uh, uh, is uh, here uh, near Kyiv, uh, for Ukrainians, it doesn't matter. Is it a Belarusian or a Russian soldier? They will kill everyone. So if you want to uh, convey it, and uh, there has to be understanding uh, on your side, because uh, if uh, it is uh, discussed in uh, Belarusian circles, uh, that uh, would mean that uh, Belarusians uh, came here uh, and they kill us. Uh, yeah, nobody is going to speak about uh, good Belarusians that are still in Belarus uh, and uh, do not uh, support it, but uh, bad Belarusians, uh, they are in the front line. So uh, those people who uh, actually do not follow the news on the television, and first of all, it's uh, about... Uh, uh, Belarusians uh, who gave me uh, words of support in their letters. But as a whole, uh, the understanding will be like this. I don't think that uh, we will have, or maybe uh, it is uh, feasible or uh, it's a good time uh, actually to uh, create a campaign to uh, speak uh, for Ukrainians that uh, those are different Belarusians. Uh, all their efforts uh, will be directed uh, to the groups uh, that are in Belarus and have an opportunity uh, to uh, start uh, killing or uh, otherwise uh, to fight the regime and uh, to use this uh, situation, uh, the war of Russia and Ukraine, uh, also to choose for themselves uh, to fight the Lukashenko's regime because that's uh, another uh, point that can actually help uh, to uh, collapse uh, 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 this re uh, regime. And uh, we need to put all our strengths uh, to uh, work at it because uh, actually this, uh, uh, if Belarusians uh, uh, enter Ukraine, then there will be first dead bodies uh, uh, going uh, back to Belarus, uh, or like uh, uh, the dead bodies of Russians uh, now. Uh, and uh, do you know what you are going to speak to uh, Belarusians? Uh, maybe some simple things. Uh, maybe you can forecast 
Uh, I uh, even uh, in the short term, uh, we can uh, think and uh, decide because uh, now there are a lot of initiatives uh, launched uh, here. Uh, so as to stop uh, and prevent Belarusians to take this step, uh, what uh, will uh, we do uh, if this uh, step uh, actually is taken? We need to understand that. So what is the second part of the question? Or I already answered. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you. Is this what you asked, Andre? Indeed, I. Uh, if we apply this logic, uh, we could say that in case of Ukraine, we cannot separate Donbass, the TNR, and LNR, and other Ukrainians. They are all, all together and so on. On the one hand, I understand your logic, but I don't think it justified it. I would like to remind you that people have, Belarusians have died for Ukraine. I understand the logic when it's uh, nobody can understand who is, who is doing what, but mass media, Ukrainian mass media, they do separate Belarusians according to the surveys and interviews, even though soldier in the wartime is not particularly dependable, we see that uh, in the hands of Ukrainians, they do separate this from that. I think this issue is particularly important considering that the definition of what the state is, how much this code is marking the real communities in Belarus and in Ukraine. So let's say these are two different things. Here we deal with the states that in Ukraine that have territorially changed. We're not saying there are no Ukrainians and we're talking about Ukraine, which in the suspended state, I mean, as a state where we cannot say that uh, our uh, state and the government are identical. This is the construct that we are keeping for the sake of convenience. Thank you, Andre. Some speakers are saying that they have to move on. And we have a question in the chat. Karbalevich also wanted to comment. The floor is yours, Valery Ivanovich. We do have more raised hands, even though we're nearing the end of our broadcast. So please be brief. I will say, let's like say a few words about uh, how this war will affect and what lessons should could be learned here, how it will affect the, the peace, the world, how it will affect change the world. Several points here. First, the question, according to the American sociologist Huntington, that the, uh, the Cold War will be replaced by the war of civilizations. Here we have the conflict of, between Russian civilization and the Western civilization. And Ukraine here is uh, has found itself in a situation where it became an element of this war. Then, so far, the nuclear weapons has become has been the uh, special um, means of holding holding on. I mean, preventing uh, other peoples uh, attacking. And in a, now that uh, it's totally different, so it's no longer a deterrent element. The Western society perceived the attack on Ukraine as an attack on the Western civilization, and this could be compared to with the 9-11 attack on the United States. Hence, the very swift and effective reaction 
I mean here the economic sanctions first and foremost. Then a lot has been said uh, about the West losing the role of the dominating force, that the liberal order is a has-been. Now the acute international crisis has led to the West showing its power, uh, acting in consolidation, and it could be the impulse of the renaissance of the Western civilization. The next point is that uh, the events around Ukraine showed that the modern societies and the role of the economy in modern society is growing and how the West reacted and uh, made a blow on the Russian economy shows that the economy is playing a major role now. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie Ivanovich. Indeed, very important points. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Kowalska wanted to ask a question. Uh, yes, hello. I don't know if everyone is Belarusian. I'm a Polish citizen, I work with Belarus. I've been doing this since 1997, and to be honest with you, now I've been shocked. I've heard that the Belarusians are neutral, the whole the contribution of security in Europe. People, if you want to make a contribution, just do it. Do it yourself. If you want to create an image, do it. So many people live in Poland during various protests, participate in demonstrations. Maybe there are two. Everybody does it for themselves. Saying that my state is this and I'm that. If you're not like this, you need to do something. This conversation is great, but now I live in Krakow. So many refugees here. I do what I can. So do my friends from Belarus. People are invited. Refugees into their if Belarusians help Ukrainians, Ukrainians will understand that Belarusians do help it. Neutrality is over. I'm sorry, but what kind of neutrality do you mean? Even Switzerland has joined. Sanctions and all. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't cover everything. But, but it was difficult for me to speak Russian. Thank you very much. We understood your point. I uh, totally agree with you about the people who are not talking but acting. And my friend, Andrei Gachov from Belarus and Fund of Belarusian Solidarity, is uh, bringing now a special field hospital into Ukraine from Poland. I would like to give floor to Arseniy for, for him to understand what neutrality here means. We want him to explain what it is meant. Yes, uh, I already mentioned the neutral status uh, in the context uh, of a uh, new architecture of European security that is going to be uh, made after the conflict. Uh, Belarus is not uh, neutral in this war. Belarus uh, is uh, actually the side of uh, aggressor um, due to the international law uh, by the fact of uh, giving the territory uh, and uh, not preventing this territory by Russian troops. So yes, uh, here we speak uh, 
what is going to be uh, in the future and uh, what role uh, Belarus is going to play. And uh, I believe that uh, um, only neutral, being neutral, there are no other uh, options for Belarus. Uh, for sure, it's not going to be alliance with uh, Russia or uh, something else. Thank you. Thank you very much for what Arseny said. I wanted to add that uh, those of you who want to read more about this should read uh, the analytical report of Rigor Stapenia and his colleagues about neutrality of Belarusians and their attitude to this. It's obvious that in this war, there is no neutrality. There's a cooperation and this and the accomplice accomplices but in the future we need to do something to overcome this we're nearing the end of our session uh, indeed i would like to thank everyone who has participated in today's session i'd like to thank everyone who was with us particular speakers from Ukraine and who are being shelled these days. It's an expert analytical club, but without a doubt, we all feel for you. I, I hope that the war will end as soon as possible. I'd like to thank everyone and we'll continue our discussion. We'll discuss the war and the, talking about it in the past. Thank you everyone for being with us. Glory to Ukraine and peace to all of us. Thank you.